So welcome everyone to our Investigate Industries and Internships I3 event for Fashion, Art, and Design. My name is Malika Santani. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm joined by my colleagues Giselle Jose and Lauren Oppenor from the USC Career Center. During the next hour, you will hear from some amazing employers who will share their industry insights with each of you on this influential and creative sector. We'll be recording the session and will be available on our YouTube channel later today. Additionally, feel free to turn on the live closed captioning on the bottom of the Zoom menu. This is one of three educational panels we are hosting this month that then leads to our Brazen Networking event on January 27th from 12 to 3 p.m., which is actually this week, so you still have time to sign up for that. Lauren will be sharing the registration information in the chat for you all to access. We'll have some time at the end for Q&A, so please feel free to drop your questions in the chat or use the Q&A function. Let's now get started and we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. So the first question is, please introduce yourself and tell us about your organization. I'm gonna go in the order of Zoom boxes. So we'll start first with Sherry. Awesome, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Sherry Smith. I represent Helen of Troy, which is a consumer products goods company. Um, we have many different brands that we actually promote, uh, that we have a tagline that we're looking to elevate lives through our products, right? And so we have uh, Dry Bar there in the Irvine, California area, but we also have wonderful brands such as Hydroflask, Oxo, Revlon, Hot Tools, uh, which is actually one of our, one that's near and dear to our hearts, right? And then we also have various products within the home and health um, realm. And so I am so happy to be here with you today. I am actually the diversity and campus recruiting manager for Helen of Troy. So I oversee all of the internship and early talent recruiting for us, as well as infuse that DE and IB um, lens into that. And for those of you that are not familiar with that, that's diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And so I'm just very excited to be a part of the panel today. And I look forward to speaking with all the students soon. Thank you so much, Sherry, and excited to learn from you. We'll go next to Peter. Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Bartle. I'm the CEO of a fashion and apparel startup in Santa Monica called Bellamino. Uh, we make clothes, content, and experiences that put a smile on your face. Our hero product is a velour tracksuit, uh, one of which I'm wearing right now. Uh, if you don't wear velour, if you're a guy, you should, because you will feel more comfortable than you've ever felt in your life. Um, and I'm excited about being here. You know, we have an internship opportunity. We're a small company. We launched last December, uh, sorry, last December. Um, and I'm excited to be here and tell you about my story. Thank you, Peter. We love the tracksuit. Like I said, perfect gold for USC. I know. And last, right, exactly. we'll go to Linda, a USC alum, so. Well, it's hard to follow in the velour tracksuit. I mean, you're going to have to stand up later and show us your full outfit because the tracksuit is two pieces. Uh, but yeah, so my name is Linda Tang, a USC alum, graduated 2008, and our company is called Contingency by Good Human, LLC, and we are based out of San Jose. We are reviving the last 3% of US manufacturing. So we do it equitably, sustainably, uh, innovatively, uh, all out of San Jose, California. Uh, so yeah, we want to be able to showcase what we can do on shore, uh, speed to market, and also take away from the global pollution that our industry does cause. So we can talk more about it later on. Oh yes, we're definitely gonna dive into that. And thank you all for sharing just a little bit about your organizations and your background. And we're gonna do a deeper dive now. So we are a career center. We are huge on always letting students know that every student has a different path to get to their next step in their career. There's no one single way to get success. So can each of you share your career path to your current role? And why did you choose this industry that you're in? Uh, I can start. Um, you know, I have a kind of more of a roundabout way. I actually, um, I graduated college a long time ago. Um, I joined the Marines right out of college, spent seven years in the Marines. And I was a lawyer for 15 years. And then just decided to start something new. I've always loved velour tracksuits. I thought they're fun, I think they're funny. Um, and it was really an opportunity to kind of start my own business and really be the, the captain of my own ship, so to speak. So, um, you know, again, I know a lot of people, you're young and you're just starting out and 
I'm sure other panelists have had the same experience, um, but the job you start out of college doesn't have to be the job you do for the rest of your life. Um, and I've had multiple careers uh, along the way. Um, and so that's how I got into fashion and LA is a great place for it because there's so many creative people in the downtown LA fashion district. There's so um, many manufacturers and, and other opportunities down there um, that you can really take advantage of uh, in Los Angeles. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's so nice to hear that you have made very different career pivots. And I think the amazing thing, and we can even touch on this further, is you probably found skills and takeaways from all those experiences right. that have now helped with this current business too. So yeah, excited critical. to get more into it. Sherry, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, no, I mean, Peter, I think he spoke to it amazingly, right? I started off as an agriculture major and started off in sales. Absolutely hated it, right? And that's okay, to Peter's point, probably what you start off in or what you have an idea of what you think is going to be your, your career path doesn't necessarily, and it doesn't have to continually steadily go in a vertical. It can go horizontal. It can kind of veer to the right or to the left, right? And that's kind of what I did. And so I stayed with the life sciences, but I transitioned over to HR probably about 10 to 12 years ago. And for me, um, because I I'm a person who thrives off of other people's energy. Um, HR and talent acquisition specifically is more um, of what I like to call my jam, right? Because it allows me to interact with students. It allows me to make that connection point, right? Because I think it's so important to really be passionate and understand that it, no experience is a bad experience. It's just a learning experience. And that's what I found along the way, right? And so when, when, when students come to me and say, this is not what I intended, I'm like, great, that's okay. At least now you know what you don't want to do. So you can kind of pursue those things that do kind of fill your cup, uh, which is important. So that's what kind of brought me to where I am today. It's huge to know what you don't want to do. And like, it's such an important <laughs> lesson because there's so many options out there. So once you can say, hey, I know I don't want to do that, you should be so excited about that and celebrate that too. Absolutely. Linda, you want to go ahead? No, I, I think um, to Sherry and Peter's point, it doesn't have to be linear. It shouldn't be linear because all your experiences uh, add, they add up and, you know, you're going to have different career paths. So when I graduated, I majored in international relations, global business and marketing at USC. So it was a hybrid major between Marshall and the IR building. And I actually went and worked for a sports marketing firm in Santa Monica right out of college. And um, we represented Reggie Bush, Matt Leinart when they first came out. We had Shannon Sharp. We had all these notable NFL guys that I pretty much took to their signings. I did endorsement deals. So very different from like the fashion industry. Uh, and then did a year in that industry and decided that I wanted to go back to fashion. I've always in in high school was into fashion. I was on the fashion board at Nordstrom. That was like a big deal then. Uh, and wanted to pursue that path because there was a need in the market space for women in action sports, women in high performance sports. There was nothing that fit women then. And I decided to go back to FITM. I did their grad school program. So FITM is down the street from USC and I majored in apparel industry manufacturing. Uh, I worked for a couple of uh, surf stand-up brands down in Orange County, uh, Ruka and Hanano, and then I uh, moved back up to the Bay Area to work for the North Face. So then my last six years were running the global quality assurance teams. So they're manufacturing overseas and uh, domestically. Uh, so it's been a great experience. So I've been in the industry now for about 14 years. And then during COVID, um, we wanted to help out. So I was already done with the North Face. The parent company, VF Corp, owns a conglomerate of brands. So they own North Face, Vans, Timberlands, Williams and Dickies, um, Smart Wool, Lucy, which um, is no longer here, but they have a ton of different um, designs, designs, and they actually just bought Supreme too. So they they're, they manage portfolios. Um, they decided to move all our uh, brands out to Denver. So I say back this was in 2019 and then pandemic hit, we started to produce face masks. We had leftover fabrics from the North Face. Uh, we converted our garage into a small um, micro manufacturer and then started pumping up uh, face masks for our community. It was just donation based. 
the feedback was great. People were like, oh, we can actually breathe in your mask. It was the first time we were using a performance knit versus I'm sure you guys could all remember during like March, 2020, everybody's like, we need to cover our faces. So people were grabbing bed sheets, coffee filters. Uh, and so we were, you know, just, we were using what we had. We were stuck at home. We, I had the experience, I had the machinery, I had the, you know, the raw materials and the feedback was great. Self-servingly, we wanted to go back to our mixed martial arts. We wanted to go back to CrossFit. And so we really geared our face masks uh, for sports performance, indoor sports as CrossFit, uh, MMA. So we got a bunch of pro athletes to help us wear tests, help us get feedback and keep developing. And um, now we are in a industrial uh, space. You know, it's not that big, but it's a small factory. Uh, we're the last 3% of US manufacturing and we're really trying to revive it. You know, it's working with local brands. Hopefully Peter later on, we can talk, we can do some manufacturing for you if you wanna bring it overseas and do it sustainable. Um, so yeah, we are, you know, it's, a, it's not a linear path and it's been a great ride and we continue uh, to just anticipate, you know, the roller coaster. I love that from each of your three just unique stories and perspectives, it really shows that you can find opportunities that not only cater to your passions, but also to your craft and skill set and make a really fulfilling career out of it. And that's what we want for every student. It's not to do something that you think, you know, like works or I have to do it because it's my major, like really think about the things that interest you, that you're passionate about, and you can turn it into something amazing. And it's okay if it's not fully connected, you're going to find ways for it to connect. So thank you all for sharing, like that could have not gone even more amazing. But now we kind of want to pivot to some of the challenges. So we know with different industries, it's not always going to be perfect. There's always going to be learning lessons. There's always going to be things that could go better. So can you share with the students on the call? What are the challenges, but also the benefits to working in your industry? And I think it's also amazing that we have the entrepreneurial side too. So I'd love to hear also what it looks like from having your own business too. So challenges, benefits. Uh, I can start. I mean, just being in a startup is just hard. I mean, there's just, before I was a lawyer, I had my little piece of the pie, which also, don't be wrong, it's quite complicated. And anytime you, you narrow, you, you, you get into a narrow not niche, but lane, so to speak, there's so much to do. Um, but for me, uh, starting a, uh, my own company, it was really hard because you, you learn a little bit about, like you kind of know about marketing when you're on the legal and business side, and you kind of know about some of those things, but you don't really know them. And then you, you have to do them and it becomes, you're, you have to do so many other things, um, uh, you know, running your own startup. Um, but it's been probably the, one of the most, it's actually satisfying things I've ever done because there are so many things you're constantly learning and constantly improving. And to be in fashion, at least for a startup company, for me, um, and I'm, Linda can probably talk about this more, you know, when you're small, like a lot of manufacturers don't really give you much time of day. You're kind of get pushed or getting fabrics and trying to figure things out. Um, so it's definitely a, a learning process that uh, just continues. Most definitely. And Sherry, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I think just some of the challenges um, that we have in our field, obviously, is, is just understanding the consumer, right? It's, it's very behavioral based, how the consumer trends change as you evolve, right? Uh, from generation to generation, there are some consumers that you have old faithful products that, you know, they've used for years upon years and depend on those products, right? But then you also see generational shifts where, um, folks want to see things that are different and more innovative and, and have evolved, right? So it's finding that good mix, right, of, of associates and, and brilliant minds that are able to help us evolve the products based on what our consumers are really depending on from us as an organization. Uh, but then on the flip side, the benefit of that is it's always fun. Nothing ever stays the same, right? Everything is constantly progressing. So you're constantly growing as an individual. And like I said, as the theme that we've been saying, growing is good because as you continue to grow, you might grow to another area, right? You might start off in one and, and want to, you know, expand and, and broaden your horizons in another area, or you can take all of the wonderful knowledge that you've learned within that and then apply it somewhere else and continue with that innovation. And so I think 
both the challenge and the benefit, right, of, of our industry is just innovation, right? Understanding innovation, how to keep up with those trends and how to continue to grow as an individual and as an organization. Did not unmute there, but I love that both of you also touched on growth mindset. Like we are an educational institution. We want you to always be lifelong learners and keep up with trends, keep up with things that you're interested in and you're gonna become the resident expert in that. But we'll go to Linda next. So challenges, uh, there's a plethora of challenges. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Peter can speak to it and and any and one of us, when you start your own project or start your own, you're, you're responsible. So the stakes get higher as they get bigger. Uh, it was a lot easier when we were in our garage. We didn't anticipate to move to an actual industrial facility. Uh, it just happened that three factories that were domestic in the Bay Area that did production for the North Base closed down during the pandemic. It was the last straw. Uh, part of it was they didn't, I mean, Sherry touched on innovation. Uh, the factories didn't innovate here. They, you know, were very stagnant and very old school. Uh, and so I bought up the remaining factories, rescued their fabrications and their equipment. And so it wasn't uh, in our business plan, in our roadmap necessarily to uh, make that jump within a year to an industrial space, because then you have a lot more expenses, a lot more overhead. Uh, my biggest concern is my people, my team, and growing them, bringing the best potential out of them. And on top of that, you are responsible for their livelihood. So their payroll, um, all these things are added stresses, not just, you know, you're it's not just me anymore. I'm responsible for my team, for my company and their, you know, their livelihood and their well-being. So those are definitely the challenges. Um, the benefits are you're going to go home and you're going to be exhausted. Like at North Face, I would go home and I was exhausted. But here I go home and I'm exhausted, but I'm I also feel this sense of uh, reward and like I, I did everything I could. Like if I die tomorrow, I knew I took those chances. I didn't let fear get in the way of like, what if, oh, I shouldn't do this. All these people are telling me not to do it. I followed my gut. I followed my intuition and I go to bed knowing that I did, that I I'm rewarded that, you know, it's stressful. It's, it's hard. It's challenging. Uh, but I know I'm in the right industry. I know I'm doing the right thing for, our company, our team, our industry, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll make an impact uh, positively on global climate change one day. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a rewarding aspect. I love that, like, when each of you talk about your industries, there's just such an excitement and you all feel this passion toward it. And I mean, I'm like, I need to look into fashion too, and just these creative roles, but kind of building off on some of those benefits. And I love this question because we're going to get more exciting answers is what is your absolute favorite aspect of your job? So I know we talked about like the rewarding, the people, but we'll change up the order. Let's start with Sherry first. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think the favorite, my favorite aspect of, of the job itself is being able to educate folks, right? Um, you know, to Linda's point, everyone has to work, right, or should have to work for a livelihood purposes, right? Um, most of us are going to work the majority of our lives, right? And so it's it's definitely being able to connect with folks, right, and talk about the opportunities, why, and what keeps me here, right? And being able to impart my enthusiasm, uh, because a part of that is being transparent about where we are. Um, ways of working have changed so much in the past two years with the global pandemic, uh, with different things that are affecting us as a as a people all together, right? Um, and I think it's important to be able to educate folks, right? Making sure that we're making the right connections. Um, work is tedious, you know. Um, there's there's no other way to put it. Work can be tedious, but being able to find those connections that fill your cup are important. Um, and I enjoy being able to work with individuals to really say and have the courage to say, you know what, based on what I'm hearing from you, this is probably not the right place for you or the right position for you. And that is okay because as part of my job, just like I want to retain and bring in talent, I want to make sure that talent understands that 
just because there's an opportunity there and you think it's something that you want, I have the insight on my side and I want to make sure that I'm keeping your best interest at heart. And so when I think about the favorite aspect of my job, I feel like I educate others on how to make that right fit for themselves based on what I know from an internal perspective and what I'm hearing from an external perspective and then marrying those together. So that's what I truly enjoy about the aspect of my my role and my job and what I do. Thank you, Sherry. And we need always individuals like you, especially when it comes for our students looking for opportunities that really want to take time to understand their needs and that fit because we're going to be working for a long time, like you said. So stay in something that makes you excited and that you want to show up to work and it doesn't feel like it's a burden. Absolutely. So Peter, Linda, anyone want to jump in? We'll go Linda, we'll change it up. <laughs> you beat me to the mute button, but yeah. So favorite aspects of, I don't like calling it a job necessarily. I feel like job has a negative connotation sometimes. Uh, so our, our company is a purpose-driven company. We, the bottom line is important, which is revenue, right? We have to make, we're not a nonprofit. We want to make sure that we're within our revenue goals because we have to pay payroll. We have overhead. Um, you want to reinvest in the company and grow the company. So revenue is very important, but we look at the trifecta of your social impact and your environmental, your, your actual company impact, the, what your people feel, uh, it as a part of the company and are they growing because those are all critical factors from my experience and this is nothing against corporations but most of the time you're just a number like you have shareholders you have other obligations which I understand when you're at the top and we're a small company yes I'm a CEO but it's a very small company we're all hands on deck everybody does a rotation program here. Not only are you doing design, you're in production sewing. You are on the laser cutter. You are meeting with clients on their next, you know, design creation, their concept, or you're scrubbing the toilet. You know, everybody here has to do every role. Uh, and I think part of the biggest reward is one, seeing everybody grow and get out of their comfort zone. And then also being able to bring awareness to our community and you uh, people about our industry and how we can all make a difference with our dollar. We all as consumers are, we can vote with our dollar. So we can choose to be, uh, we can support the brands that are doing something ethically well, sustainably or performance or purpose-driven, right? So being able to kind of shine light to our industry, the choices that you have, kind of what Sherry said about transparency. Our industry doesn't have a lot of transparency. A lot of it is done overseas. A lot of it is done in third world countries and usually women, women of color getting paid 20 cents a day. And so what we're trying to do is give people microdoses of sustainability and how you can make better choices it's not to make anyone feel guilty. It's not to, you know, be like, oh, you have to go zero waste, vegan, and, you know, zero carbon footprint. Like, it's not going to happen tomorrow, right? We all have to do it in small micro doses and kind of just getting people, uh, my goal is just to get people curious. Like, oh, so like, how long does it take? This is my favorite question. And you guys can throw it up. Like, how long does it take for one disposable mask to break down, fully break down into the earth, one disposable surgical mask? Anyone want to throw out any numbers, guesses, and on how many years it takes? Three. Go ahead. Just shoot. Yeah. Three. Three years to break down. Keep going. Five. More. Ten. More. Seventy. More. <laughs> Anyone else? Keep 100. going. Way more. Thousand. A little bit lower. <laughs> Seven fifty. A little bit lower. Ooh, 600? It's 450 years. Wow. For one disposable face mask to break down. Every single piece of plastic that has been manufactured to date is still on earth. So whether it's in microplastics, whether it's in, you know, 
in the ocean, in the landfills. We are not perfect by any means. I'm not trying to guilt anybody. You have to wear a mask. When you have no other option, you have to wear a disposable mask. You have to wear, you know, medical purposes. You have to wear N95s. I'm not disregarding any of those things. But because of COVID, because of the one-time use, because of everybody's fear of, you know, like we 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 want to stay safe, but there's other options out there, right? Just like when everybody started converting over to their hydro flasks or their Yetis, or not to bring out other brands, but like that saved everybody's small habitual change stacks. And that's what actually ends up making a difference. And so being able to kind of educate consumers and people who didn't think you know, it's not your fault that you just didn't know. People are so disconnected from their garment. You don't know who made your jacket. You don't know how many hands it touches, how many millions of miles it's had to travel, uh, you know, the supply chain, you know, where it's coming from, Taiwan, and then it goes to Asia, you know, to Cambodia, and then it goes through across the Pacific, and then it goes to a DC, and then, and then it finally gets to your hands. So it's kind of bringing all that on a smaller level so people can be a part of the program, part of the experience, think how we can change it from, you know, fast fashion to slower fashion. I love fashion. Like it's a part of expression. It's a part of your, your aura. It's, it makes you feel confident. I'm not disregarding that you need to be able to express yourself. Clothing isn't going to go anywhere. I would, I mean, unless we're all going to join a nudist colony somewhere, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Yes, clothing is here to stay. And I, you know, appreciate that point that you made. Like I brought up like Travels of a T-shirt was my like game changer book on understanding like globalization and our impact because I never had any idea of where our clothes came from. So just illuminating and something for students to check out. Peter, do you want to share your favorite aspect of your work, organization, job? Yeah, I mean, the, the favorite thing uh, about what I do is uh, creating something that gets to people and brings a smile to their face. I mean, we, we're in the Lord's practice. It's a kind of a fun, it's a funny, it's a comfortable thing. We try and uh, focus on colors that are bright and energetic and we have some darker colors too. But, um, you know, that to me, and, you know, when you, when you create something from nothing and then you, you, you have a product that, that people like and they buy and they talk about and they send you pictures of, and smiling, it just, it just is incredibly satisfying. Um, and I actually, you know, it's funny. I mean, and I think Linus is about a job. You know, there's always that's kind of one small aspect of what I do every day, and then the rest of it's kind of all damage control and 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 and, and, and coordination. But I actually love that too. I mean, I just I, I just treat it as more of like a challenge to overcome rather than rather than like a, a pain in the butt because. Um, because every job is going to have those pain in the butt aspects, probably a lot more than the things you like to do. And so um, if you don't look at those as continuous learning that we talked about or an opportunity to get better, um, it can just be, um, it can really bring you down. So. Awesome. And then my last question before we switch over to more about hearing about your internships and what you're looking for with students, you know, we are here in the business of supporting students, especially at a career center, we want them to grow their skill sets because that's gonna be one of the most valuable things that they're bringing into any type of environment when it comes to their career. So what are some of those hard and soft skills that should, like students should work on in order to thrive in your industry? Whoever wants to jump in. Linda, go ahead. Some hard skills, uh, it would be pay attention in accounting. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> uh, so it's just good to know. I mean, if you want to do uh, in, if you are on the entrepreneurial route, uh, I think, you know, those hard skill sets of just for, for me, it was, you have to learn, you know, pay attention to geometry, pay attention to accounting, pay attention to chemistry, physics. I mean, in a performance, you know, apparel end, you, the, all those factors go in. We are doing polymer sciences. We are doing textile sciences. We are doing lab testing, consumer testing, uh, abrasion testing, color fastness. Uh, floor, you know, there was, we had to figure out fluorinated versus non fluorinated chemicals, DWR. So, like, the hard skill sets, like, it's like fashion when it's avant garde and couture is very different from when you go into 
Everest, you know, North Face, where we were literally sending, you know, athletes up to uh, climb Everest or Antarctica. So it's a, it's a different, this is where your gear is going to save your life versus on the runway. So there are two different spectrums. So I would say hard, hard skill sets are, I mean, in your classes, those actually do pay off. Um, and then paying attention, paying attention to accounting, uh, when it comes to running your own business, uh, it's really helpful. Uh, we have an accounting team, thank God, thank God. Uh, but you know, just understanding how the class flow works, how all those aspects flow into, because those are vital signs to your company. So understanding how to read a balance sheet and profit and loss statements, those are absolutely critical. Uh, so those are the hard skill sets. And then the soft skill sets are, you know, just growing you, invest in yourself. You, no one's going to take that away from you. So like all the job experiences, the shitty jobs, those are all great work experiences that add on that build on top of each other. Um, like Peter said, you have to have that perspective of it's problem solving. So like you either can go into it with the mindset of, you know, oh, I'm overwhelmed. I can't figure out these problems or like, no, there's 12 ways from Sunday. I'm going to figure this out. I'm just, I'm just going to keep trying. And then it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask, you know, um, be vulnerable. Those are all great soft skill sets. Uh, and then the other part is your reputation, like integrity. Um, I wouldn't be here without all my mentors, all, all the support, my friends and family, um, our company right now, we're in the part, we're in the process of, um, our first round of seed funding and, and just because of, you know, I stayed true to myself, my reputation, I've been able to, you know, just get tons of friends and family to invest just based off of me as a person, you know, not even, they didn't even want to look at our financial reporting or anything like that. So I think that's been just in retrospect, like, you know, just stay true to yourself um, and invest in yourself and get mentors. Yes, plus one to the mentors and in investing in yourself. Peter, Sherry? Peter, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go. I mean, I would just say, um, kind of to kind of follow Linda, like be very curious about the various aspects of where you are. I mean, the best part about being young and being right out of college and trying something, go, especially going to a bigger company perhaps, um, is you can, you have a lot of opportunities to do various things and take advantage of it uh, because, you know, I've, my career has definitely been one where my every experience has stacked um, along to the next. And so, um, I've learned a wide variety of things in all the various experiences. And I think part of that uh, was because I, I, I really made an effort to try new things um, and things that were way outside my comfort zone. Um, I mean, fashion four years ago, I had no idea what a pattern was or how things got made. It just was, it's been quite a journey and along the way. And I think uh, so that's been very valuable being curious. And I just want to also say, kind of reinforce what Linda said is that, you know, I've, I've had a number of jobs in my life and I, I haven't gotten one through a want ad or LinkedIn. It was all through people that I work for that you do, you do a good job for, and then they will recommend you if you choose to do something else. It's so critical to do, to be focused on finding good mentors that can really help you advance your career. Um, and you may have to go through a few people in the beginning that don't really work and you find somebody new, um, but that's really important. And also I think, um, being like a warm and friendly person. I mean, no one wants to be around an a-hole. Uh, so just be a nice person and be interested, not interesting per se, be interested in other people um, because um, most people love to talk about themselves and, uh, and you, always, uh, you always become a, a, a good person if, uh, anyway, if, if, if you're interested as opposed to interested. No, seriously, just going back to our roots, the basics, always just be a good person. It goes a long way and it's going to help in those networking, you know, things that you do, finding a mentor in your classes, be nice, like really think about that as you go throughout your life. But we'll close out with Sherry before we start pivoting to any of our student intern questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think Linda and Peter have done a really great job, right? From a hard skills perspective with consumer products and goods, um, it just really depends on the area that you're going into, right? So from a design perspective, is if it's marketing. So what I would say to that from a hard skills perspective is just making sure that you're honing in on your skills. Um, as Linda said, make sure you're paying attention in your classes, right? Being able to speak into those things 
you're going to take in a lot of information um, and we don't expect you to remember every little nook and cranny of class, right? But I think it's important to really understand where you think you want to be uh, because then you can really hone in on those skills rather than trying to like a whole cake, just take a little couple of nibbles, right? And really hone in on those so that way you can make yourself kind of a master of those things so that you can really continue to build upon those. And then it's okay to keep the rest of those nuggets in the back of your mind because maybe if those initial bites don't work well for you, you still have the awareness to kind of pick up those pieces and really hone in on those from a from a hard skills perspective. Um, from a soft skills perspective, Linda said something that was really important uh, where she said to be vulnerable, right? And that is important. I think there's a level of uh, vulnerability that definitely goes a long way. And what I would say to that as well is being authentic. Um, you... It, it, it's really it's really important to be comfortable in who you are and being able to show up as yourself, right? Um, and I think it's important to be proud of how you show up as yourself, right? You don't have to try to conform to what you think I want to hear, right? Um, I, I'm going to use something you can't BS a BS -er. Okay. Um, and so it's important to show up authentically as yourself because I, I guarantee you showing up authentically as yourself goes so much further um, than, than you would ever imagine, right? Um, and it's, it's one of those things that actually makes you stand out a little bit more from the rest. Because if everyone is looking to be authentic and vulnerable, but telling folks what they think they want to hear, we're going to hear the same things over and over again because you're competing for the same thing. So being authentic allows you to actually stand out and stand out from the crowd and that's what allows you to be more visible for opportunities as you go and compete with so many of your peers across the globe uh, for these opportunities. Thank you. And I really want to echo the authenticity piece. Like you have one life to live, like you want to show up in spaces as yourself. And it's a perfect segue to our next question. So Wait, sorry, with... Malika, can I, can, I, can I say one thing about that? Oh, too? yeah, go ahead. You said kind of talk about what Terry just said, mm -hmm. uh, just to reinforce that. Consider it a gift if you if you are authentic and you don't get the job that you're going for. Consider that a, a huge gift. You are, you would you have saved yourself years of pain and unhappiness if you try to be somebody you're not. Um, even if it's a prestigious job, even if it looks good on your resume, whatever it is, it will be a, a gift. You will you will you will thank the person that did not give you that job for over and over again. Uh, because just just talk to somebody that was an investment banker. Not the one going to investment banking, but who said four years as an investment banker, and, you, and you'll figure out the, the difference between, uh, you know, what they thought they were getting into and what they ended up getting into. That's so true, Peter. So true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah take those blessings in disguise. And sometimes it's not the best feeling in the moment, but it definitely works out later on. And you're going to be like, I am so grateful that that happened. But kind of going into that, you know, for all these different roles, we are, you know, hiring different students. So we want to know what type of qualities do you seek in ideal interns? So when you're getting applicants, when students are interested in coming to your organization, what are those qualities that you're looking for that you hope a student has? I can start. I was looking for somebody, again, kind of going to the curiosity thing. I want somebody that's going to come and be positive and we just want to work. I mean, we're a small business. Uh, everybody does everything in my business. Um, that includes packing, packing shipments, doing customer service, going downtown to pick up fabric. Um, there's a wide variety of things that you do. Um, and so just gotta be interested in, interested in learning. I mean, there's no expectation on my side that anybody that comes to work for me, I mean, it'd be great if it happened, but is gonna spend the rest of their career with me. Like this should be a time you learn, you get a chance to try new things, uh, be part of a great team, um, but then, and then potentially move on to something else. Yes, it's important to have that curiosity because you also don't want to go into a space being like, I'm better than this, or I already know that, so I don't need to learn it. Like, take every opportunity as something new that you're going to learn something from it. Thank you for that. Sherry or Linda? Yeah, I, I can go. Or, yeah. Uh, so for interns, what we're looking for is you have to be okay with controlled chaos here. It's, you know, like like Peter said, we, we're still a startup too. Uh, and any day, you know, it could be, we're doing production cutting, we are doing um, a social media calendar, we're doing a pop-up shop. Um, 
I do apologize. We are a dog. And then one of our benefits here is we are dog friendly and there's a bull mastiff that's snoring really loud. She's taking her afternoon nap right now. So, um, but yeah, so we are looking for, you know, it's the attitude, you know, the, I want to solve problems, the integrity part and the intellect. Those are, you know, we look for those. I can't teach you those skills. So those are things that you have to already have in your personality type that you're okay with learning. Like you said, you want to continue to grow. You're open-minded. You want to learn new skill sets, hard and soft skill sets here. And you're flexible. Um, this is definitely a very entrepreneurial space. We want independent thinkers. I'm not here to micromanage. So we want people to be very independent and, but also collaborate. You know, we're, you spend 40, 50 hours you know, with your, your, your coworkers, those are your second family members. Like you have to have a good relationship with them and feel comfortable and you be authentically yourself here. 100%. And I love the integrity piece too. I think it's something that we all take for granted too, but it's so important that when you go into spaces, you're being truthful and honest and sticking to your values. And that's also something to look for when you're looking at companies too is really think about what they're committing to and what they're saying. And if that doesn't align with you, it's probably not the best fit for yourself. So thank you for bringing that point. Sherry, yeah. any, anything else? No, I think both Peter and Linda really hit most of those qualities that we look for outside of, like I said, generally whatever role that you're, you're looking to obtain, right? There are gonna be some technical skills that we're going to look for, but really that collaboration piece, that independent piece, that being able to uh, work in ambiguous situations, right? And so, you know, to Linda's point, there's going to be chaos. There are going to be times where you're not going to have all the details or the details might even seem fuzzy, but being able to trust yourself, right? And trust that we trust you in the position to make the right decision and be okay with making mistakes, right? Because that's how you learn. That's how you grow. I think it's more important uh, when you think about mistakes to think about the intent, was there ill intent, right? And typically nine times out of 10, for the most part, it's not ill intent. And so the mistake can be corrected. It might be a little bit of a growing pain, right? To work through the mistake. But I mean, that's how you grow. If, you, if you're maneuvering through anything that you do and you're not making mistakes, you're really not growing. You're really, really not growing because there are constantly things to learn. There are constantly things that you're going to uh, be faced with and you're going to be faced with a decision. And I would hope that you would try different methods, right, to resolve issues. So that way you can really kind of learn as you continue to grow. Um, and so those are some of the things that we look for uh, when we're looking to hire early talent interns into the organization. Thank you all so much. I think it gives students some peace of mind, too, because I feel like when I work with students, a lot of times the fixation is on do I have other work experience? Do I have internship experience? And a lot of times I'm like, your life experience by just interacting with different people, going through different conflicts, hardships, experiences are what you need to take into the workspace more sometimes than just working in an office or having an internship. So just remembering that a lot of those skills that are so desirable are taught throughout your life and you're not just learning it in a classroom or in an internship that you've already had, but you're gonna build on those skills throughout your life and through more experiences. So I want to go back to the mentorship networking piece. And we know that especially in your industry, just given that it is a very creative, you know, influential industry, networking is huge. So what advice do you have for students when it comes to networking? Because it can be something really intimidating and scary. And if you're, us, like somebody that doesn't have a big network yet, it can also feel really intimidating to just jump into talking to somebody and asking that advice. So any open advice on networking when it comes to your industry? Um, I think just networking overall, right? It, it's important that you're, you're relationship building, right? And to Peter's point, when he said, you know, not necessarily being an inter interesting person, but being interested in people. So really it's just getting to know someone with the intent of simply getting to know them, right? Not necessarily thinking about the end game. 
Because when you start thinking about the end game, it's like, okay, what am I getting out of this relationship, right? It kind of steers it to where it becomes manufactured, where it feels like you're wanting something from me rather than truly valuing the network that you're building, right? Um, at some point or another, you are building that relationship to hopefully rely on that. But even if, I think you should go in with the intent that even if nothing comes from this relationship other than me meeting a new and interesting person and them getting to know me, I think that goes a long way. And I think that takes away some of that initial hesitancy and that initial nervousness about looking to start networking and starting to build those relationships because you kind of take that pressure off of yourself to really gain something from that versus just literally getting to know that person and allowing them to get to know you too, because hopefully as they get to know you, they're thinking in their mind, I'm like, wow, Peter's a great individual. I want to stay connected to him. Wow, Linda's a great individual. I want to stay connected to her, not because I I ever think I'm gonna, going to go into entrepreneurship and start my own you know, company, right? It's literally because they are fascinating people and I just want to get to know them and stay connected to them and see how they continue to grow throughout their journey. Um, and that takes away, like I said, a lot of that pressure that sometimes people have and, and trying to figure out, okay, what angle do I need to take in order to effectively network? I absolutely love that. Remembering first that we're humans, we're all about building relationships. That's how you get through life and put that as the focal point when it comes to networking. And it makes a lot of easier connections as you approach different folks. Linda, Peter? Yeah, I can. Um, so for networking, well, so I'm going to speak from an extrovert. So it's maybe a little bit easier from an extrovert. Like I'm an extreme extrovert. My, I love meeting new people. I love approaching new people. I love like uh, Peter and Sherry were saying, just like talking to people, genuinely getting to know them and building on those relationships. I think part of it is a lot of people want instant gratification. They're like, oh, I need a mentor. I'm just going to be like, hey, I'm going to, I mean, you can go that approach and just like, and that doesn't either, that doesn't hurt to ask either just by like cold emailing or going through a second degree of someone to like ask them to give you an intro. That does work too. Um, but I think the most genuine way to do it is to build on your relationships and maintain those relationships. Just maintain those relationships authentically. Like be you because you care about that person. I think a lot of it, people forget that like you have to care about the person and people are going to know right away if you're not being genuine, if you want something, you know, from them. And I think just listening, I think that's a big part is being able to have that conversation, listen, ask curious questions, get to know them more. And that'll eventually build on itself. I know it's not instant. It's not, maybe it's not what you guys want to hear. It's not instant gratification, but it got me to where I am today you know, I wouldn't have been able to get my North Face job if I didn't have my mentor who in, who knew someone at North Face. They were uh, spring engineers for race cars. And, you know, so it's one of those things where Peter said, like, I, I didn't have to apply on LinkedIn, actually any of my jobs. They were all through referrals. So, and that's because I'm, I'm, I value my relationships and it doesn't matter. It's not about what they can do for me. I genuinely value my relationships and my friendships for the people who they are. Yes, and Peter, go ahead, jump in. <laughs> yeah, just to build on what both Linda and Sherry said, it's amazing, um, and I agree. I mean, 99% of the of my networking, because I'm actually interested in people, um, I just like hearing about people. Everybody's got an interesting story, they've done something cool that you can bring out. 99% um, have not resulted in anything other than a friendship. <laughs> That's it, That's all you're gonna get. Um, and maybe a little bit of advice. Um, and so I agree, like it just, you just gotta kind of go out there. Um, and for those of you who think you have a small network, um, your friend's parents may have been doing something that, 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 um, that you're interested in, or they may know somebody. Like I, the reason I, I found out about a little bit of how to make the Lord track suits was my wife's mom's friend happens to run like a leather business or be involved in a leather business in downtown LA. And that's, I didn't, I, that's how I got the connection. I had no other connection to fashion but I think you'd be, if you think about your friend group and what people they do um, and who they may be exposed to, um, they could probably introduce you to people along the way. But again, I think going back to what both Sherry and Linda said is you have to be interested in people because if you're just trying to be interesting, they, 
they might not find you interesting. Um, and everybody loves to talk about themselves. So just, just think about when you go to a mentor, I like to think about like 10 questions I would like to ask them and do some research. Everything's online now. You can look at somebody's LinkedIn profile and get a, a general sense about their career path and what they've done, their Instagram, whatever, in like 10 minutes. It's so easy. Um, and I always think it's weird whenever I talk to somebody, I get introduced, introduced to like a mentorship or somebody wants to meet me or we, or we talk or whatever, I get to somebody. And like they didn't spend five minutes like looking at like what I've done. Not, not that I'm super interesting or whatever, but like, but just, it's just kind of a basic thing now of just, it's so easy to, to kind of figure out where people are and, and what they've done. Um, but again, going back to what Sherry and Linda said, just be interested uh, as opposed to interesting. 100%, like I cannot underscore enough that we all don't have an excuse anymore to not use technology for our benefit when it comes to anything life related, like all the answers are on Google whether it's to get insights on a person so that you can jumpstart that conversation or learning more about an industry that you're interested in. Use it and use it as a tool as well to stay connected to people that you build relationships with. You don't have to constantly meet in person, but you don't know how far a message of just checking in on somebody, seeing how they're doing, a catch up goes in life because all that truly matters at the end of the day is those connections. And you wanna start cultivating that and remembering we're human first. And that will help so much throughout your life. But thank you all so much. We're gonna open it up to some student Q&A as well for like the last few minutes. So we got one question in the chat and students keep them coming. But how do you determine the difference between having a plan and tunnel vision? And so hopefully we can get some more insights. But I think this is a really good question when it comes to just thinking about your life and your career. So. I think for me, right, um, plan versus tunnel vision, a plan is something that can change, right? Mm -hmm. You're planning for, for, for an outcome, but hopefully you're planning for several different outcomes, whereas tunnel vision is that you just get so fixated on one particular path and one particular outcome that you miss out on all the things that are going on around you and some of the things that maybe you could have pivoted into and still created a plan to focus on those areas, right? And I said areas, not just an area, right? So that, I think that's the most important thing to think about that a plan can change and it can have multiple avenues. Whereas tunnel vision, you're just, you're just big on that one area and you really need to, you have to be able to pivot. And I think that's part of some of the soft skills that you have to have when moving into whatever industry you choose to, to uh, Falling right, it's that you have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to wind, curve, bend it like Beckham a little bit, whatever the case may be, right? Um, to be able to keep up as you continue to uh, throughout your career. Thank you for sharing that because I cannot underscore what we talked about at the beginning that there's no linear path. And if there was a way to get from point A to point B perfectly with that big salary and all the success in the world, we would only be talking about that. But it's so different for everybody. So it's always better to stick to a plan that allows for flexibility, pivots, changes, things to come up versus just being fixated on only one way to do something. There's so many options out there and it's gonna be so different for everybody. So thank you for sharing that. Another question that we got is, can um, the panel speak to how you maintain your network and stay in touch after you do a coffee chat, informational interview, or meet them at an event or interview? What can you say? What are the reasons to reach out in order to maintain that relationship? Um, I just uh, I uh, like to read uh, news, and I'm, I'm interested in fashion and, and and business. So if I have like a relationship with somebody, um, and you like during the course of your conversation with them, you find out like not necessarily what they're interested in business, but let's just say they're a sports fan or they like art or things like that. Um, like I just will find interesting articles sometimes and just send to them, hey, I saw this article, I thought it might be interested. And that's it. Like, and then oftentimes they'll respond or or then you can set up another copy. Or even just if you haven't talked to them in a while, saying, hey, listen, it's been a while. I'd love to take it for coffee and hear more about X, Y, and Z. And some people may say no, but that's just how it goes. They may be too busy, but others may love it. I mean, I think most people, I would say, like to kind of get out of the office and and meet and go to a different coffee place or something like that or lunch. Um, coffee is also good too because it's short. You don't have to get like awkward silences while you're waiting for the food to come if it's delayed, right? right? Um, 
So and, and people can leave. It's only like, like a half hour. That's all you got going on. So um, I, I, uh, I and that's what I would do. Just try and keep up and, and find their interests and, and send them things that are interesting in that space. Yeah, it's a good balance too of from that initial conversation and as you build up of not just, you know, talking and thinking about questions, but have that active listening skill as well. Like you really need to take in what they're sharing so that you can build off on that. Any other advice or tips that have worked? I will say birthdays are the best if you're connecting with alums when it's you're at a sports school, like talk about football, talk about basketball, you see something exciting about USC, send it to them. So Linda, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so are we saying like in this hypothetical situation, like you've already made a, you've already like gotten an introduction and you just want to maintain the relationship? Yeah. So I think for like this student's case specifically, like we have so many different events for students to meet people, whether it's a coffee chat, informational interview, mm -hmm. career event. Mm -hmm. So you met, you connected, but how do you keep that relationship going after that event? Yeah. I mean, I think part, I know we keep saying this, but like, listen to the person, find out their interests and how are you going to bring value to them? Right. So like, if you're, if I'm coming from a student's perspective, like the person that you're trying to get to be your mentor or, uh, your potential, like, you know, uh, hiree are, you're going to want to see how you can bring value to them too. Right. So it's, you know, like sending something fun or informational to them that you think they would like, or if it's something physical that you can do to go to the location and be like, oh, could I actually like do some free labor or learn or come in and tour your place? Um, and most, I would say most people who are being approached as like, I would like you to be my mentor one day are going to be more cognizant and be, you know, they know they want to help students. So I wouldn't, I would just say, just try, you know, just you have to try. It's okay if you get rejected, then it wasn't the right fit. Yes, 100%. And I always want to remind students of this, like every person that you're interested in getting to know, whether it's somebody higher up in an organization, an alum, another person, like they all were in a space where you were, where they didn't have that connection. They were getting that curiosity. So they can relate to that. They can understand that, you know, we're all just trying to learn, trying to figure out what we want. So remember that we've all been there and we all, again, going back to that human connection, know what it's like and we want to give that back. And it's okay if you get a rejection. There's so many other people out there to connect with, but we're getting up to time. But for all of our students attending, you can meet all of our amazing panelists on Thursday, talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, ask them more questions. So definitely sign up for our Brazen Networking event. Hope you all stay safe, stay well, and thank you so much for being here and fight on.